Welcome to Family History Mysteries, a podcast that tells the stories uncovered through family history research, the unexpected stories of everyday people. I am an avid family historian who has been compiling my family tree for over 15 years, with nearly 20,000 people recorded in my trees. Episode 52, The Harriet Family. In episode 49 on Percy Moran, the name Harriet featured as publicans of the Sportsman's Arms Hotel in North Deniliquin. There is also a street in Deniliquin named after the family. It piqued my interest in wanting to know more about them. Arthur Harriet was born on the 5th of February 1805 in Edinburgh, Scotland. He married Jane Stewart on the 11th of June 1832 in Felkirk, Stirlingshire, Scotland, but Jean died in September 1862. They had five children. Arthur Harriet emigrated to Australia, and in 1889, there was an obituary on Arthur Harriet, which gave an insight into his life. It said the death is announced at Carathool, which is near Deniliquin, New South Wales, last week of Mr Arthur Harriet, father of Mr William Harriet, who owns the Forgambella Hotel at North Deniliquin 20 or more years ago and was the uncle of Mr William Harriet, now of the Globe Hotel. The deceased gentleman was educated at Dick's College, Edinburgh and finally obtained a diploma as a veterinary surgeon. He commenced practice of his profession in Felkirk in Scotland, then as new, one of the greatest horse markets in the United Kingdom and remained there for a long period of 42 years. He was for many years a veterinary surgeon to the Earl of Zetland and many other noblemen of the sporting tendency, besides which he enjoyed a large private practice. He was a skilful anatomist and obtained a large amount of pleasure in adjusting the skeletons of favourite horses for their respective owners, and on one occasion he arranged one for the Museum of Stirling in Scotland, for which he was offered and declined a sum of £50. Many years ago, his only son, Mr. William Harriet, the cousin of Mr. Harriet of the Globe Hotel, Deniliquin, came to Australia and settled at North Deniliquin, where he purchased the old Fog and Bella Hotel, which he subsequently called the Sportsman's Arms, a name it still bears. After some years of prosperous business, he sold out and took his boys to Scotland to have them educated. Later on, he returned to the colony and settled at Carathool, where he was joined by his father, who by this time had retired from his profession on the account of his old age. For a time, Mr. Harriet practised his profession privately, but his old love of anatomical specimens was still strong, and on one occasion he set up a frame of a valued horse by the imported sire Athos for his son, the specimen of his handicraft still being on view at the Carathol Hotel. And just as an aside, the Carathol Hotel in 2010 was destroyed by arson and it reported that the pub was 156 years old at the time that it burnt down. The old gentleman passed away peacefully on the 21st and was followed to his last resting place by a large circle of family and relatives. And as a veterinary surgeon, he was one of the first men to administer chloroform to a horse in the Deniliquin area. So Arthur's son, William Harriet, he initially emigrated in 1857 and he married Jane Kerr in Deniliquin on the 4th of April 1858. It seems that William added an extra R and an extra T to his name once he came to Australia to spell T, which is the name of the local street in our town today. His firstborn Arthur's records are all with the name Harriet and a double T. John Dillon purchased the Fogabula pub in North Deniliquin in July 1859, but soon left to run a pub in Wanganella, another small township near Deniliquin. He remained in a shared licensee role with William Harriet until 1862, and in 1862 William Harriet took over as the sole licensee. Four years later, William sold the pub to his cousin, also called William Harriet. William and Jane Kerr had four children, and Jane died in February 1874 in Carlton. He then married Elizabeth Davies in Hay in May 1874 when he was 41 and Elizabeth 28. Elizabeth was Welsh and had married after emigrating to Australia to Rhys Davies in Coringa, South Australia, when she was 20 in 1865. And I found an article that mentions about Rhys Davies in March 1866, so a year after he married Elizabeth, 
Mr. Rhys Davies is no longer in my service nor authorised to act on my behalf. And that's from H.C. Palmer at Kapunda in South Australia. So she had two boys to Rhys. One was in 1867 and one in 1869. And there is a South Australia Police Gazette notice on Rhys. So I suspect based on that advertisement that Elizabeth had been deserted. And there is a family tree that has a record stating that Rhys Davies died in Melbourne in 1869. And when William Harriet married Elizabeth, her boys were seven and five, so collectively they had eight children together. William had the South Hay Hotel in 1875. William died on December 1883, aged 51, six years before his father's death. And there was a small notice in the paper saying, Death. Mr. William Harriet, cousin of Mr. William Harriet of the Sportsman's Arms Hotel, North Deniliquin, died suddenly at Hay on Wednesday night. The deceased was an old resident of Deniliquin, but had moved to Hay some years ago and has since then been in business there. And another more detailed article says, The southern death of Mr. William Harriet of Carathool created a painful sensation in Hay when it became known on Thursday. The deceased gentleman had been at Hay attending the sessions where he had a slander case against Mr. J. Parr. This greatly worried him and there is no doubt that this led to his death as any excitement was prejudicial to him. He had for some time been ailing. He returned home on Wednesday night and died that night. Death was caused by disease of the heart. We understand the slander case and other disputes about property matters had been mutually settled before Mr. Harriet left Hay. The body was brought to Hay by the train on Thursday and the funeral took place on Friday at three o'clock. The numerous at attendance testifying to the high respect the deceased gentleman held. Mr. Harriet was a very old resident of the Riverina. He was for some time with Mr. Taylor of the Royal Hotel de Niloquin and was afterwards in business himself at the Fogabilla Hotel on the side of the Edward, now known as Sportsman's Arms. Mr. Harriet afterward opened the South Hay Hotel, now occupied by Mr. McLaughlin. Afterwards, Mr. Harriet went to Carathool, where he acquired large interests, most of the land in and around that town being his property. And there also is a note that there was a magisterial inquiry into the death of William Harriet. And Catherine Harriet, the daughter of the deceased, stated that on the evening of the 5th, her father had tea with the rest of the family as usual and ate heartily. He went to bed shortly afterwards. The witness went to his room after he had gone to bed, where he asked her to get him a drink of water. He spoke in his usual manner. When the witness returned with the water in about five minutes, she saw his head was hanging over the side of the bed, and she noticed he'd been sick. She exclaimed, Father, what's the matter? He did not answer, and the witness ran off and brought her mother. Elizabeth Harriet, the wife of the deceased, deposed that her husband had been complaining more or less about pains in his head and his side for the last seven weeks. His appetite generally had not been good. Dr Harvey had prescribed for him, but the deceased said he did not think the medicine he gave him was doing much good. The deceased was talking of going away for a change. He always appeared to feel the first heat of summer for the last four or five years. Dr Wilkie had said the deceased had received a slight touch of sunstroke four or five years ago. He often complained of pain in the region of his heart. The deceased had not been drinking any spirituous liquors for the last fortnight and he'd only been eating light food. At half past eight on the fifth he went to bed. He had generally gone early to bed since he'd been ailing. He came home from Hay on the train on Wednesday morning. The deceased had said he had not been well while he was in Hay. He had a case on in the district court and it seemed to harass and unsettle him. After he went to bed his wife took him out a clean night shirt and then she saw nothing wrong about him. About a quarter of an hour after he'd gone to bed, she was called by her daughter Catherine. When she got into the room, she found the deceased's head over the bed. He had been sick. She lifted his head back onto the pillow. The deceased never spoke to her afterwards. He only breathed once or twice heavily. She had seen him take nothing and had no idea that he could have taken anything poisonous. His father had come in and helped her with the deceased. The deceased was 51 years of age last month and had eight children alive. He did not struggle after she came into the room, nor was there any sign of a struggle previously. Arthur Harriet, the father of the deceased, stated he was talking to him on the night in question. 
The deceased after a while said, I think I'll go to bed. Good night. He seemed a little dull, but there was nothing wrong with him. When he went into the room on being called, he noticed that there was a long interval between the breathing. It was more like a deep sigh. His pulse was scarcely perceptible and he died without a struggle. The deceased was born in Scotland and had been in the colony for 32 years. Daniel O'Connell deposed that he was living on one of Mr Harriet's selections. He'd known the deceased for seven years. The deceased would occasionally have a booze. He then would give up taking anything for months. He had broken into one of those periodical boozes about three weeks ago. The witness went on Sunday fortnight to bring the deceased home from Hay. He believed he had knocked off the drink since then, except a nobbler or two after he returned home. The deceased said that he was bad and he thought that it was the drink that had made him so. On the whole, the deceased was considered a fairly temperate man, but his habits of drinking occasionally may have weakened the action of the heart. Dr Casey deposed that he had viewed the body of the deceased. There were no marks of violence. Having heard the evidence of the previous witnesses, he believed the cause of death was disease of the heart. He thought the disease had been accelerated by worry and the effects of his late drinking bout. The coroner found that the death was caused by heart disease. In April 1883, Elizabeth was listed as the licensee of Harriet's Family Hotel at Carithal. Elizabeth went on to marry again to Joseph Killander in Hay in 1894. It was noted that on April 1895, so a year after Joseph married Elizabeth, in the licensing court, that Harriet's family hotel Carothal, the licence was granted to Joseph Killander. However, Elizabeth died on the 21st of September 1897 in Surrey Hills, Sydney, aged 52. It seems that Joseph left the district around May 1902 and possibly went to Western Australia. On the 11th of May 1912, there was a small article that says Joseph Killander, no description, formerly a storekeeper at Carithall, New South Wales, in partnership with Jacob and Anthony, arrived in this state about 1904. And that was an article in Western Australia. It took until 1912 to validate that he had been found in Perth in Western Australia. So 10 years after it was suspected he'd gone there. William Harriet and Jane Kerr's children. The first born child was Arthur Harriet and he was born into Nelequin in 1860. He married Catherine McInnes in Hay in 1890 when he was 30 and Catherine 22. He was living in Hay in 1894 and he died in 1933, aged 73. And a small article outlining his death says, Grazy as death, the late Mr A. Harriet. Mr Arthur Harriet, who died on Saturday at his residence at Abbotsford Road, Homebush, was formerly the owner of Mulga, a sheep station in Hilston. He was born in Deniliquin 73 years ago and educated in Scotland, but subsequently returned to Australia to engage in sheep farming. He retired some years ago... He had a widow, two daughters and two sons. So Arthur Jr., Jean, Annie Muriel and William Malcolm and both sons, Arthur Jr. and William, fought in World War I. Their second child was William Harry Jr. He was born in Deniliquin in 1862 and died in Newtown, New South Wales in 1924. Jane Harriet was born in Deniliquin in 1967, died in Heidelberg, Victoria in 1920, aged 53. And Catherine Harriet, known as Kitty, was born in 1868. She married John William Davies in Carithal on the 30th of January 1893, and she died in 1918 at Carithal. She had two children, Rhys Davies and Gwendolyn, and John was a son of Rhys Davies and Catherine's stepmother, Catherine. So I mentioned Rhys Davies earlier and how Catherine had been previously married and had two children, the boys four and seven. Well, one of those sons married one of William Harriet and Jane Kerr's children. So I suppose step-siblings, but no genetic link. So with William's second marriage to Elizabeth Harriet, the children that survived beyond infancy were Elizabeth, born in 1876 in South Hay, Elizabeth married John Christopher Smith and died in Hay in 1934, aged 58. And of their marriage, there were two sons, 
William E. of Exeter and Norman of Hay, and also a daughter who was Mrs. Roke of Winton, Queensland. Their second child, Mary, was born in 1878. She married Thomas Joseph Tynan in Dulwich Hill, New South Wales in 1897. She was 19 and Thomas 27. They had four children, Elsie, Eileen, one that became a nun, Sister Basil, and Eric. Mary died in Sydney in 1926, aged 48. Their third child, Lawrence Harriet, was born on the 24th of December, 1883 in Hay. He married Annie Matilda Smith at Burrow in New South Wales in 1911. They had one daughter, Mary Madeline Harriet, who was born in 1909 in Cootamundra. They lived in Orange in 1913 and Lawrence was a railway porter. Lawrence died in Randwick in 1961, aged 77. The fourth child, Alfred William Harriet, was born at Carathool on the 11th of August, 1884. His father had died in the December of the previous year and his mother died when he was 13. And, and as I mentioned earlier, it seems that his stepfather had disappeared to Western Australia. So this did not end well for Alfred. He was charged in Tamora, New South Wales on the 26th of February 1905 for drunkenness. And then he was charged in Hay on the 26th of February 1906 for assault causing bodily harm. And he was sent to Goulburn Jail. So there's quite a detailed account of the assault in Carathol. This is titled The Alleged Assault at Carathol, Full Particulars, The Evidence at Police Court. At the Carathol Police Court on Friday the 2nd of February 1906, Alfred Herriot, a young man of almost 21 years of age, was charged with assaulting Henry Solomon with intent to rob. Senior Constable Cole stated that about 12.20am that morning he heard cries of police and murder. He recognised Henry Solomon's voice and he ran around to his place. In the lane between Solomon's store and O'Donnell's hotel, he encountered the accused who was running. The witness called on the accused to stop. The accused tried to dodge him. The witness got in front of the accused who ran towards him as if to strike him. The witness put up his revolver and said, if you don't pull up, I will put a bullet through you. The accused replied, it's all right, Mr. Cole, I'll go with you. He took the accused into Solomon's backyard and there found Solomon lying on the ground. Solomon was moaning and saying, I am killed. James O'Donnell, who was present and who had called out to the witnesses to stop the accused, said, that is the man that was killing Sol when I came out. He was sitting on him, thumping him on the face with both hands. And when I heard, the man ran away. He then took the accused to the lockup. It was 8am and he was formally charged with intent to rob Henry Solomon and cautioned him. The accused said he was lying asleep in the corner of the yard and Solomon came to him and woke him up and struck him and tried to put him out of the yard and he only assaulted Solomon in self-defence. When he arrested the accused, he was quite sober. He did not hear the accused say a word all the time the struggle was going on. He searched the accused in the morning and found a purse, sixpence, a packet of cigarettes but no weapons of any kind. The accused had no occupation that he knew of. He found one of Solomon's shoes on the back veranda near the iron door and the other one just off the veranda. Solomon was lying 24 feet from the iron grill. There were marks of a struggle on the ground from the veranda from where Solomon was found. Solomon's face was badly cut about, especially just under the right eye, which looked like pulp, and he complained of pains in his arms, the result of blows. He produced the accused shirt, which was covered in blood. Solomon was unable to attend court and he asked for a remand to allow him to appear. The accused was remanded for eight days and on Tuesday last, the accused was brought before the court. Henry Solomon's storekeeper stated on Thursday night on the 1st, he was working in his office with his manager who had left at 10.45pm. The witness then locked the back door, known as the Iron Grill, and went back to work. About a quarter to twelve, he went to the back door, unlocked the grill and opened it. As he went to go out, he received blows on his face from some person. That was the first intimation that he had that anyone was there. He closed with the assailant on the back veranda and grappled with him. 
They got from the boards to the soft ground of the yard where they tumbled. The witness fell underneath. His assailant was on top and hitting him all the time on the face. As far as he knew, no weapon was used. He commenced to sing out police, murder and thief. His assailant put his hand right over his mouth after hitting him several blows on the mouth. He tried to push the assailant's hand away to enable him to call out, in which he was fairly successful. The struggle went on for some time and he became exhausted. He threw up his hands and said, I am done. Before that, his assailant had grasped him firmly around the throat and made an effort to choke him. He got his hand away, but his assailant again caught hold of him and he was done. He felt as if he was choking. His assailant's grasp was so strong that he could only gasp. He felt pain and inconvenience. All the time he was lying on his back and the assailant was on top of him and he fainted. The next thing he remembered, he was seeing several people standing around. The accused was not there. He could not say who his assailant was. He was practically dazed from the first blow. He would be 67 years of age in July and had been very unwell lately. When he was able to distinguish his injuries, he found his face was bleeding from the cuts and the residue of the blows he had received. The scars now on his face were marks from the blows. Both inside and outside his lips were cut and bleeding. He was bleeding from the cuts throughout the night. One of his front teeth was loosened. He received a bruise inside the ear which was still showing. In the morning his throat was sore and slightly swollen. He was shaken all over the body and bruised on his knees. He had a very severe shaking up. He had consulted no medical man. He was still suffering from the injuries. No one had any right to go into his store that night. He had known the accused for 13 years. The accused had no visible means of support that he knew and he did not bear of good character. About six years ago, he found the accused had striked his sister in the hotel passage. He interfered and took hold of the accused and removed him from the passage. There was no bank at Carathul and he had to keep his cash takings in the store. James O'Donnell, hotel keeper, stated that on the night of the first he was awoken by fierce barking of the dogs in his yard, which adjoined Solomon's premises. He heard a man singing out murder. He ran down to the fence that divided his yard from Solomon's. Henry Williams was with him. He saw two men struggling on the ground. One of them was moaning very much. He he sang out, police, murder. I went with Williams towards the men. Directly I got on the fence and into the yard and the man who ran away got up. He heard Senior Constable Cole sing out, what's the matter? He replied, take that man who has gone up the passage. I pointed to the man who had got up and ran away. I saw the constable take the man. It was the same man who had been struggling with Solomon. He saw no one else in the yard when the struggle was taking place. He struck a match and looked at Solomon. He got two pillows and put them under his head. Solomon was sensible. There were marks on Solomon's face from which blood was flowing. He could not identify the accused at the time. Henry Williams, public school teacher, stated that he was sleeping in the yard of O'Donnell's hotel. He heard somebody calling for help. He went out with O'Donnell towards Solomon's yard. O'Donnell leaned over the fence and said, What are you doing there? It was a call like murder which awakened him. When he got to the fence, he saw what appeared to be two men struggling. One man was on the ground and the other appeared to be getting up. He went over to the spot. The man who had got up ran away. Senior Constable Cole brought him back. He went over with O'Donnell and saw Solomon lying exhausted on the ground. At a later period, he examined the yard with the constable and O'Donnell by means of a lantern. No other persons were on the scene when he saw the two men struggling. Cuthbert Griffiths Baker stated he was with the accused from 1 to 10 p.m. on the first playing billiards. They had some wages and witness won a couple of pounds from the accused. He did not know what became of the accused after he left him at 10 p.m. to attend to his doe. The accused was not too sober. He was excited but not drunk. He had been drinking. The accused, who did not question any of the witnesses, was then formally charged with assault with intent to commit a felony and reserved his defence, and the accused was committed to take his trial at the Hay Quarter Sessions to be held on the 26th of February. Bail was not asked for. So when this occurred at the Hay Court, Alfred Harriet did put forward a statement. 
He said that he remembered the day of the assault. He was playing billiards with Griffiths up to 10pm. He'd neither had lunch nor tea. They had drinks between each game, except that he had four packets of cigarettes. He did not remember anything after leaving the hotel until he was woke up and struck in Solomon's Yard. He was lying asleep in Solomon's Yard. He got struck. He then in turn struck him. They grappled along the veranda and knocked against the water bag which fell. They then struggled along the yard where they fell over the wire. Solomon then called out, police, murder. Solomon took hold of him by the hips and tore his trouser pocket. He struggled to release himself and at last did so. He ran. O'Donnell said, what is this? He ran past someone. He did not know who. Cole said, stop or I'll put a bullet through you. And I said, there's no necessity for that. I'll go with you. When Cole took him back, O'Donnell said, this is the man that was trying to kill Sol. It was not true that he struck Solomon at the back door. He had no grudge against Solomon. So in the Hay Quarter Sessions, in the paper on the 27th of February 1906, Acting Judge Ralston determined that Alfred Harriet was charged that he did on the 1st of February Carathol assault Henry Solomon with intent to rob him. On a second count, the accused was charged that he did assault Solomon and occasion actual bodily harm. And on a third count with assault, the accused was found guilty on the last two counts and sentenced to 12 months hard labour in Goulburn Jail. On each count, sentences to be concurrent. He was discharged from Goulburn Jail on the 27th of November 1906. And there was a decomposed body that was found in the Macquarie River a mile from Narramah, New South Wales, on the 20th of October 1916. And it was ascertained that Alfred Herriot had been missing from town for about a fortnight. And after investigations, it was found that it was Alfred Herriot and he was only 32 years old. So I mentioned another William Harriet and how they were first cousins. Their fathers, John and Arthur, were brothers. And this William Harriet was born on the 27th of March, 1842, in Polmont, Scotland. So his parents were John Harriet and Christian Drydstall. John was a farrier in Scotland and came out with his family on the ship Undaunted and arrived in Melbourne, aged 41, on the 24th of August, 1857. William's mother, Christian, died in Hotham, Victoria, only three years after their arrival of a ruptured spleen in 1860, age 59. So William's father, John, brought land at Jetho, Victoria, and he died there in 1882, age 67. William's sister, Jane Ness, was the sole recipient of the proceeds of their father's will. So William's first position was at Murrumbidgee Station, after several years, he came to Deniliquin as a manager for the North Walkall Station for Henry Gwynn. He then left for Tumbarumba to manage a property and then came back to Deniliquin. He married Sarah Winterbottom in Deniliquin in 1864 when he was 22. Sarah was an English-born girl who had emigrated with her parents at the age of eight to Swan Hill. In May 1866, William Harriet purchased the pub Fogabilla in North Deniliquin from his cousin William Harriet, and it was this William Harriet that changed the names to the Sportsman's Arms, as at the time he was known to be something of a local dashing sportsman. He placed a landlord in the pub initially, so Thomas Stanley was the landlord from 1868 to 1870. In the 1870s, William rebuilt the pub, made it into a weatherboard building. In 1874, William had a horse that he named Fogabilla and he raced that locally. And in 1904, William was elected as a life member of the Deniliquin Jockey Club in recognition of services rendered to the club in its infancy. In 1897, he sold the Sportsman's Arms and he purchased the Globe Hotel in Deniliquin. And in September 1892, it says Mr William Harriet, who is the oldest publican of Deniliquin, has purchased the lease of the Deniliquin Coffee Palace, which he intends converting into a hotel under the name of Tattersall's. The Coffee Palace used to be known as the Australian. So in 1892, the family were living in a home in Deniliquin they called Felkirk. And in August 1898, it says that William Harriet of the Tattersall's Hotel has left Deniliquin after a continuous residence of over 35 years. 
Bill's taken on the Prince of Wales Hotel at Ascot Vale near Melbourne and he takes with him the good wishes of the people of this town. So in 1908, we find that William has returned to Dinaliquin. There's a prosecution under the Liquor Act mentioned in the paper in November 1908. At Dinaliquin on Wednesday, William Harriet, licensee of the Railway Hotel, was charged before the police magistrate for Sunday trading. The defendant was fined five pounds with six shillings cost in default of one month's imprisonment. Notice of appeal was given. William died four years later on the 8th of September 1912 and the article outlining his death says after an illness extending of over 18 months, the death occurred on Sunday of Mr William Harriet, who for 50 years has been a well-known figure in the Dinaliquin district. He was born in Scotland and Mr Harriet came to Australia as a youth with his parents. He lived in Melbourne for some time and then came to the country to obtain experience in station life. He proved himself to be capable amongst stock. He became prominently associated with all matters affecting the welfare of the town. The hotel business was a prosperous one. Mr Harriet was above all things a keen sportsman. In his younger days he owned, trained and rode horses with varying success. He was always a popular follower of the sport. His association with the Dinaliquin Jockey Club extended for 30 years or more and to mark their appreciation of his services as a supporter of the club and a member of the committee some years ago, the committee appointed him a life member. Mr Harriet in his younger days was a successful cross-country rider. In numerous hurdle races and steeplechases in the Riverina and Victoria were won by his horses. Amongst the best performed of his jumpers were Tipperary Boy, Rob Roy and St Ewan. The deceased was one of the trustees of the cricket ground for a long period, and only resigned from the trust on account of ill health a few weeks ago. During his residence in Dinaliquin, Mr Harriet gained the lasting friendship of a very large circle of friends, and the representative gathering of townspeople at the graveside on Monday bore eloquent testimony to the high esteem in which he was held. He leaves a widow, a family of five sons and one daughter. So William and Sarah had seven children all up, six which survived beyond childhood. Their first child, George William Harriet, was born in 1868 in Dinaliquin. He married Adelaide Annie Dean in Essendon on the 16th of September 1895. They returned to live in Dinaliquin in 1896. He was a hotel keeper like his father in Dinaliquin and he also became a magistrate in Dinaliquin in 1904. By 1914 and 1915, they were living back in Mooney Ponds and George was working as an engineer. By 1918, they were living in Mathara and running the Railway Hotel, and they held land there. He was a starter at the Dinaliquin races and other regional meetings for many years. And George and Adelaide had one daughter, Margaret, who married Ernest Glenn, that lived in Mathara. And on the occasion of his death, it was outlined in the paper that Mr George William Harriet, formerly a well-known resident of Dinaliquin and Mathara, died suddenly on Friday week at Geelong. The deceased was the son of the late Mr and Mrs William Harriet, who were amongst the earliest residents of Deniliquin. Mr George W Harriet was an engineer by profession, but was for some time in charge of the Riverina Frozen Meat Company's plant, and he survived by his wife and one daughter. Their second child, Sarah, known as Sadie, was born in 1870 in Norbury, and at the age of 21, she was listed in the Australian Star as a lucky sweep winner. So in Aubrey, it says, A report from Deniliquin gives particulars of a stroke of luck in connection with the running of the Carrington Stakes in Sydney. Two local residents, Mr Robert Mann and Miss Sarah Harriet, invested 10 shillings each in the Tattersall's £50,000 sweep, which was only half filled and got a ticket which represented the second favourite too soon. Too soon won and the lucky local investors drew £7,695. Sarah married Robert Steele in Victoria in August 1899 when she was 29 and they lived in Melbourne and had two daughters. One of them, Edith, died in a car crash in 1939 and Sarah died in St Kilda, Victoria in 1960. Their third child, Thomas Gibson Harriet, was born in Deniliquin in 1872. He married Ellen Peavers in Deniliquin in 1900. He was a carpenter. They had four children and only one child outlived them. Thomas died in Deniliquin in 1960 at the age of 88. 
They had one son, William Edwin Harriet, and he was charged with embezzlement in September 1934. And the outline of this case says embezzlement charges. William Edwin Harriet, 33, Clark, appeared before Mr Stevenson in the Central Court today, charged on embezzling 41 pounds, 5 shillings and 2 pence, and 26 pounds, 6 shillings and 11 pence, and stealing 74 pounds, 11 shillings and 4 pence, and 6 pounds, 15 shillings and 6 pence, while employed in the public service as Clerk of Petty Sessions at Coolerman and Ganmain. Detective Buckley said that he told Harriet, who had recently been suspended, that an examination had been made of his books by an officer from the Auditor General's Department, and that his books showed a deficiency of £150, and that the department had decided to institute proceedings against him. Harriet, after reading the report, said, according to Buckley, I'll make a statement of the whole thing. Harriet pleaded guilty and elected to be summarily dealt with. Mr Barry of the Crown Law Office for the prosecution said that Harriet had paid £139 into the superannuation fund and could make restitution from that. Harriet was discharged conditionally on his entering into his own recognizance of £40 to be of good behaviour for two years and he was ordered to make restitution of £125, 7 shillings and 6 pence. He married Kathleen Lyons that same year in Wagga and he worked as a clerk of petty sessions in Wagga and then in Sydney. They had one daughter, Mary Rose, who was born in Wagga in May 1934. Mary became a school teacher and did not marry. William enlisted in World War II in Paddington, New South Wales on the 24th of June 1940. He left Australia on the 17th of February 1941 and was reported missing on the 16th of February 1942. And it was ascertained that he died from illness while in a POW camp in Thailand on the 5th of July 1943. The fourth son, Edwin Harriet, was born in 1874 in Deniliquin. There was an article in 1890, as a 16-year-old, it says, Master Ted Harriet, a Deniliquin boy, successfully rode Mr Rupert Clark's horse, Tarua, at a recent meeting and has been handsomely rewarded by the owner. Mr Clark presented the young rider with a valuable gold watch and to commemorate the late victory, Mrs Rupert Clark has given him a beautiful chain and locket. Both presentations bore complimentary inscriptions. Mr and Mrs Rupert Clark's well-known love of horses makes it doubly certain that equine successes with which they are connected will not pass unnoticed. Edwin married Ida McCulloch in 1902 in Victoria and he was a jockey of course and they lived in Sudbury. And there are a few articles that mention Ted. February 1904, the Victorian amateur Mr Ted Harriet steered enchanted states to victory in the hurdle race at Williamstown on Monday, a performance which contrasted favourably with his previous effort on the same course with enchanted states, and Mr Harriet came to grief at the first flight of hurdles. In May 1906, ex-Riverina horseman, Mr Ted Harriet has accepted a position to manage a stud farm, the Beehive, for Mr Ernest Clark near Melton. It is quite probable that the capable Sunbury cross-country horseman will be seen no more under silk and he will be missed from the ranks of amateur riders. He carries a few trophies with him to mark his career in the saddle and has cannoned with Mother Earth on more than one occasion. We congratulate Ted on his appointment and wish him every success in his new sphere of life. It is quite in keeping with the order of things that after so many falls he should have a rise. Harriet had a miraculous escape from serious injury a few days ago, being thrown heavily on his head while schooling Royal Mail over the hurdles at Sunbury. The horse rolled over Harriet, who sustained a severe shaking and several abrasions to his head and face. And in 1912, Ted Harriet, the retired amateur rider, is now the proprietor of the Laurel Hotel Ascot Vale and he held that pub until 1917. By 1925, he was working for Delgetty & Co. And Ted died on the 9th of December 1947. And an article in the paper mentions that the death occurred recently at his home in Mooney Ponds, Victoria, of Mr Edwin Ted Harriet. Deceased was born in Deniliquin over 70 years ago, and in former years was keenly interested in amateur riding and won many hurdle and steeplechase events. Of later years, he has been associated with Delgetty & Co Limited as a traveller for Whitehorse Whiskey. 
He is survived by his widow and two children. And an article in The Age on his death noted amateur rider dies. Mr Edwin Ted Harriet, 73, who died at Mooney Ponds yesterday, was formerly a prominent amateur rider at hunt club meetings. Mr Harriet won many hunt club cups and other races between 1890 and 1907. One year he rode the winner of the hunt club steeplechases on three successive Saturdays. Mr Harriet was an original member of the Mooney Valley Racing Club and Oakland's Hunt Club. For many years, he was a country representative of Sepult's Mines and in later years of Delgetti & Co Limited. The fifth child, John Harriet, was born in Deniliquin in 1877. After his schooling, he worked as a clerk for Mr Wilkinson, a well-known solicitor in Deniliquin. He then went on to be employed by Mr A.H. Windermeyer, in which he was qualified as a solicitor by 1913. He married Zerilba Myra Ernge in Deniliquin in 1900, but she died in Victoria on the 5th of June 1900 when giving birth to their son, Stanley Drysdale Harriet. He then married Annie Marilma Ernge, known as Gurley, Zerilba's sister, in Wallara, New South Wales in 1903. They had two children, Beresford and Mavis, and Annie died in Essendon in Victoria on the 6th of August 1909. John was the only Deniliquin born person at the time to have qualified as a solicitor without going to university. He was a leading cricketer and a keen lawn tennis player. In 1914, he was sent by Mr Windermeyer to Gerildry to head up a branch of the firm, although it didn't prove to be very successful and was closed after a few months. He then established his own business in Deniliquin that he ran for 12 months. John married for the third time to Ethel May Semple in 1915 in Deniliquin. He moved to Sydney in late 1916 and was employed by ship Wayne Hearn. John died on the 26th of November 1917 at his home in Neutral Bay, aged only 40 and only four months before his son Jack was born on the 21st of March 1918 in Deniliquin. And unfortunately for John, his death was by suicide. It says an hour after he bought a bottle of lotion at a chemist shop at Neutral Bay yesterday afternoon, Mr John Harriet Solicitor was found in a dying condition in his bedroom with an empty bottle found nearby. A cup was also found empty, also smelling of the lotion. When the doctor arrived, life was extinct. So poor John, he had two wives die very prematurely. He had care of children that he had with the two wives so three children all up and then went ahead and married again and unfortunately ended his life before his fourth child was born. His eldest son, Stanley Drysdale Harriet, was only 17 when his father died and he left in Eloquent in 1918 and married Eileen Hart in Victoria in 1924. He was a military instructor and gained the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. He was decorated by the Queen when she came out to her visit to Australia in 1954. They lived in Hamilton, New South Wales in the 1930s and Stanley died in Ascot, Victoria in 1960, age 60 and they had four children. John's second son, Beresford George Harriet, was born in Deniliquin in 1903. On the 17th of September 1925, he became a petty officer in the Navy. He married Ione Kiss in Victoria in 1944 in 1949, he was in the Naval Police, and then he was later a police officer in Nidri, Victoria, and he died in Nidri in 1990, aged 87. His sister, Mavis Kate Harriet, was born in Deniliquin in October 1908. She was a tailoress that lived in Deniliquin in 1930, and she married Reuben Russell in Deniliquin in that year. Reuben was a cabinet maker, and he enlisted in World War II, where he was also a petty officer in the Navy. They lived in Brighton, Victoria from 1955 and Mavis died in April 1985, aged 76. The youngest of John Harriet's children, Jack Lorraine Harriet, had a difficult start in life. As mentioned, his father died before his birth and then his mother died when he was 16. He enlisted in World War II at Puckapunyal in 1940. He enlisted his maternal grandmother as his next of kin. His occupation at the time of his enlistment was a winderman and cutter. He married Annette Stanmore in South Yarra on the 24th of October 1942 and he was in the RAAF from the 4th of December 1942. 
1943, his occupation was listed as a papermaker living at Terelgan, Victoria. At the end of 1944 and into 1945, he served with the RAAF in Egypt, Greece and the Middle East. He disembarked in Sydney in November 1945 and was discharged on the 14th of March 1947. By 1949, he was an advertising manager living in Hawthorne. Annette and Jack divorced on the 24th of February that year. He had no contact with the child they had together, Marlene Atina, who was born in South Yarra in July 1943. He married again to Jean Futrell in 1953, and then he married again for the third time in 1977 to Maria. He died on the 22nd of February 1966, age 77. And William Harriet Jr. was born in 1879 in Deniloquin. He moved to Perth, Western Australia and was a chemist assistant and he died in East Coolgardie in August 1919, aged 40. He did not marry. And William's younger brother George also lived in Deniloquin. He was born in 1849 and was seven years younger than his brother and he married Mary O'Shea in Victoria in 1877. He died on the 27th of May, 1903, and they had three children. And there's an article outlined in the Deniloquin paper on the death of George Herriot. Mr G Herriot, who has been in the employ of the D&M Railway Company for many years, died very suddenly on Wednesday morning. Mr Herriot returned from Echuca with a special train last Sunday morning and afterwards appeared to be suffering from a severe cold. He returned to work on Monday and Tuesday, but on Tuesday night his cold became worse and he suffered acutely, so Dr Graham was sent for. Before the doctor arrived, however, Mr Herriot was dead. As Dr Graham had not previously attended the deceased, he could not give a certificate as to the cause of death and an inquiry was subsequently held before Mr J. Kelly, JP, a finding being recorded that his death was due to heart failure consequent to pneumonia. Mr Herriot was a brother of Mr W Herriot of the Railway Refreshment Rooms and was one of the oldest employees of the D&M Railway Company, a competent engine driver, a reliable servant whose services will be missed by management. Mr Herriot was 54 and leaves a widow and a family of three children. So there were quite a number of Herriots that we would consider to be founding citizens in Deniloquin and the surrounding area. And after researching them, I can clearly see why one of our streets in Deniloquin is named after them. If you are interested in sharing your story on my podcast, Family History Mysteries, please go to my Facebook page and send me a message. If you would like some assistance in filling in the gaps in your family tree to see what mysteries you solve, please get in touch. And don't forget you can have early access to episodes by subscribing and you'll also gain access to bonus episodes.